kill you in truth with my guys, Chad Brown. Nate, oh, oh, scissors. Oh, scissors. Oh. Well, don't run with those, but you can yeah. certainly cut things. Well, you, you know, you can kill somebody with truth with scissors. Fellas, 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 the big press conference, the PPPP, the Peyton, Peyton, Penner Presser, or Peyton, Peyton, Penner, Peyton Presser, or Penner, Peyton, Peyton. Well, you know what I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. Big takeaways. Chad, let it rip. What did you think about what they had to say as a, the Broncos year officially ended? Uh, I will steal a phrase from Sean Payton. No big whoop. No big whoop whatsoever. There was no news broken as far as I could tell. Uh, it was standard end of the season press conference conversation. Even the conversation about Russell Wilson was as transparent as could possibly be. Oh, you still – maybe have some trade possibilities so you can't say that you're definitely going to release right. Russell Wilson on this day. Right. You keep you're keeping that that door open, kicking that can down the road a bit. Uh again, nothing new there. I was uh, this morning thinking about on all the 15 post season pressers my coaches and front offices did. No news was broken. Um just like that. And so yeah, I'm not surprised that it was framed and structured that way and your kind of thought yesterday about the ambiguous ambiguous time of the press conference and maybe there was going to be some kind of breaking news uh didn't pan out it was just about as normal as i would have expected nate yeah i'm gonna be honest i didn't i didn't really watch much of it uh i saw some clips and whatnot and some stories some headlines and they seemed to be much ado about nothing. Um, the only thing that was like of note, and you can describe this or or expand upon this, DMAC, was that it's possible that Russell comes back, right? So um, in what role would he come back <laughs> if he were back? Doesn't seem like that would be the smartest thing for the team. Um, you know, if you draft a young quarterback, you're probably not going to want him to study under the guy you think sucks. So, um, but <laughs> that's well said of all the ways to put it. That's the best way to put it about like why you wouldn't want, like, I've never heard a lot of people out oh, the cap hit this Nate. Great point. Why would you want somebody to learn under somebody you think sucks? That, yeah. it's, it's as simple as that. Well, let me give you guys this. Let me give you that. Guys. How about the fact that George Payton was even there? So, yeah, the, the timing of it and how they were working it out. Two things. George Payton was there. What does that say? And Greg Penner did speak. You know, you don't have to have the owner speak at this thing. So we don't hear a lot from Greg Penner. So, Nate, how about that? The fact that the Broncos are moving on with Payton, Payton, Penner, Payton, Payton, Penner, <laughs> Penner, Payton, 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 Penner, Payton. You know, what about that? I think it's good, man. I, I, I do because, look, these are all – not not Greg Penner. He's a self-admitted non-football guy, right? But George Payton, Sean Payton, Payton and Payton. These guys are very smart football men. They've been studying this sport their entire lives. So really, it's about collaborating and working well together. And, and they've only been doing so for less than a year now. So I think it is smart to keep them around. Uh, you know, figure out if you can get something going together, get the rhythm, just like an offensive line continuity, just like the players as well. The front office needs continuity too. And so if you're always turning that over and looking for the next best thing, you know, Sean Payton clearly last year when he came in and he started assembling his team, realized that maybe he didn't have as many options out there as he thought. He had a hard time staffing, uh, you know, his team. And maybe he doesn't have his pick of the litter. Maybe he can't make wave his magic wand and get the best dude in the world to come and work with him. And so in that regard, I think George Payton, a guy who's well-respected around the league, a guy who by all accounts does his homework and knows every, I mean, when I met the guy, he still had the scouting report on me in his head. Wow, that's you know what I'm saying? So he knows everybody. He knows everything he does. He handles, he handles things. I think very professionally in a way that the old school Broncos would appreciate and that Greg Penner appreciates. And so, and I, and I also think Sean Payton likes to be the lead singer of the band, man. Mm -hmm. And George Payton's fine taking a step back and, and, and letting him do his thing. And I think, look, I think it's good to keep them, keep the band together going into year two. Chad, there was a funny moment um, when Mike Cliss asked a question, he goes to George, good to see you. And I, <laughs> I, 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 I talked to Cliss later and, and that was, you know, a snarky said on it was a funny comment because you don't see George Payton anymore, Chad. Not now. You used to. So when Cliss goes, good to see you, there was just a little there was a little snark there. Uh, I think that's a nice uh, job by Cliss to, to point that out in a nice way. Uh, but I think as Nate was just saying, 
uh, Sean Payton is the lead singer of this band. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when the press conference opportunities come, Sean Payton speaks first or speaks loudest or is the keynote speaker, whatever the situation is with the three P's out up there speaking. And as far as Greg Pinner goes, let's not forget that Pat Bolin and the Bolin family was a long time owner of this team. And I think Greg Pinner recognizes that the structure of this team, it's important to the city. And it's important that the city knows who the owner is and has some kind of connection to that because of the long time relationship with the Bolin family. So for Greg Penner to jump out there in, in these moments, I think there's a football purpose to it to show that the band is, you know, although Sean Payton's a league singer, the backup singers and the bass player and the, and the guitar player, they're all in full support and they want Sean Payton to be successful. But also this town expects ownership to be visual and be part of the, the communication process. And they need to know that there's somebody in charge up there and we need to see that person from time to time. Yeah, I, Greg, I think. Uh, sorry, does Greg Penner need to uh, buy a, a fur coat and some uh, <laughs> allig- some gator skin boots and some aviator glasses? Uh, is that the next move for him? No, I think I think the town will allow uh, Greg Penner to be Greg Penner, but still, we need to see the owner and know about him and know that he's deeply invested in this football team. Greg Penner is actually a pretty fascinating dude, although you don't know too much about his personal history because he's just not kind of uh, out there all the time like some of these other owners. But the dude's climbed all the seven highest mountains in the world. He's an outrageous athlete for a guy of his age. He's just born rich guy shit right there. (laughs) All right, bro. (laughs) It is, man. It takes a certain amount of uh, ability, effort, and determination to do that kind of shit. And free time as well. Well, yeah, okay. And money. And a lot of money. The guy who's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, I recognize that is not not, uh, a quick trip, nor is it an inexpensive trip. Yeah, Greg Penner's not putting a, a, a Jan Sport backpack on and walking up that thing by himself. All right. There's a lot. Of- <laughs> Dude, you're, you're, listen, man, you're, you're fun. The guy, listen, the guy is a cool dude. I'm kids He's, endurance. I know, guy. I know, I know, I know. But I think you see the owner. I'll tell you this. I do think he's a he's very engaged in the team. I don't know if it's more than people thought he was going to be. It's more than I thought he was going to be. That's for sure. So for however much money he has and how much time he has on his hands, I think his dedication to the team. And you're right, Nate or uh, Chad, rather, he is learning. You know, he's not a football guy yet, but he is putting in the work to become better at that. There's an interesting question. Where does the buck stop? Who does have final say? Now, yesterday, they said, well, we've never even had a situation like that because it's so much consensus because we get along. At what point, because there had to be a point where Pat Bowen, and maybe it was in the beginning, where he did have final say on things. Chad, at what point do you think Greg Penner will put his foot down and be more declarative about what's right or what's not right for the team, even if it goes against recommendations from Greg, uh, from George Payton and Sean Payton? I think that's going to be a tricky one. There's a couple of different types of owners within the league. And there's owners who insert themselves into the football conversation constantly. David Tepper in Carolina, Jerry Jones in Dallas. And there's owners who stand back and allow the football people to do what football people do. Um, The Rooney family, for example. Uh, Three coaches since 1969 for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So an, an amazing amount of patience. They have withstood some bad decisions, some awful decisions, some bad seasons, uh, yet until the organization finds ways to continue to move forward. So for Greg Pinner, I'm sure we, I think would all agree that he seems to be a very smart guy, whether we, uh, you know, uh, poke fun at his seven summits uh, uh, accomplishments, he seems to be a smart guy. And so I think from an ownership perspective, you got to study other owners and you got to figure out what kind of owner do you want to be? One of the last things I talked about with Pete Carroll, when I left my internship with the Seattle Seahawks was, Chad, if you become a coach, you need to figure out what kind of coach you're going to be. You can't walk mm-hmm. in the door uncertain of that. You've got to figure that out. So I'd imagine Greg Pinner has looked around the league at the other 31 ownership groups and tried to figure out what kind of owner he's going to be. And I think he's going to side with the ownership that allows the football people to make their football decisions. So it would have to be a pretty monumental decision that uh, they could not reach consensus on to – for Greg Penner to exert his ownership influence and say, hey, it's going to go this way, fellas. Well, right I now, got one. I got one, guys. You got I got one? one. Well, yeah. Oh, well, I'm interested to hear what you think would meet that threshold. Drafting a quarterback in the first round, Nate. I really do. I think that's something that 
the owner of the I think I no, I I think it sets the tone for everything. I think you know, where are we gonna go here? And I think the owner of the team has the right to understand why or why not you're doing something, Nate, especially that big. Go ahead, Chad. Well, I was just gonna say, is he part of the conversation as to get the approval to draft a quarterback in the first round and maybe to move up in the draft, as opposed to I need your approval that we're going to draft this kid is the ownership no, making no. the player decision as opposed no. to the structural decision, structural decision. Only. Okay. That's Stru yes. ownership structural. Really needs to be involved in that. Like, like, no, no, I don't think the owner should say, no, it's Penix, not, uh, you know, Bo Nix, nothing like that. Daniel but, Snyder, RG3, right. Ex yeah, no, that, not like that. That was that. a nightmare, nightmare of yeah. uh, epic uh, uh, Agreed, but if right. you're not picking a quarterback this year in the first round, you better explain why and how we're moving forward, and then you better be accountable for it because I got plenty of evidence that we should do that, no matter, you know, but forget about the specifics of the guy. But I, I really do think in football, Nate, it's that big of a deal why or why not we're doing something when the situation presents itself. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack with that idea. Um, um, you know, I think despite the fact that there is a new owner, a very rich one, by the way, whose wealth, you know, like you could add the, 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 the next four richest owners in the NFL wealth together and double it. And that doesn't equal the, the crazy. Peter Walton. Right. So they have all the money and they've been spending the money and still they had more no show uh, no show games or seats in, you know, like number of no shows at home games than, than probably since the seventies this year. I mean, there were some huge no show games. Why is that? You got the coach, you got Russell Wilson, you got a new ownership group who's throwing money out. Is it really just the quarterback D Mac? I mean, would, would a, would a first round quarterback put the asses in the seats there or would they not come for a couple more years until the Broncos started winning? And so I think winning is the most important thing. And actually, yeah, putting po points on the board as well. No one wants to see 16 to 12 games uh, and, and, you know, spend as much money as they have to spend as a family to do so. And I think Pat Bowlin, some of the lessons he learned were through going, having successful years, getting to the Super Bowl, and then getting your ass kicked in the Super Bowl uh, several times. And, and really, Mike Shanahan, when he became the head coach here, it was under the pretenses that he was going to have a lot of control, um, a lot of control, kind of like Sean Payton has here. So it wasn't like Pat Bowen was a hands-on guy telling him who to draft or what to do in that regard. He was letting him make the football decisions. What he was doing was providing him with all the resources to be able to do all the things right on and off the field to make sure your players were playing their best. And not only the players but everyone in the building was the top top five in the world at what they did that was the pat bowen model and so yeah. i think greg penner should do that you know should focus on making everybody in the building fucking awesome at what they do so the mm -hmm. players can be fucking awesome at what they do and let sean payton handle that shit i don't think that he could tell sean payton to draft a quarterback you know in the first round unless you love that quarterback you know and and, and then you risk doing the rg3 thing where you you're doing it for promotional marketing purposes and you end up tanking your team because of it well, I'll, I'll inherently agree with you, even though it's my own personal opinion what they should do. But I, I will agree with you that, no, you shouldn't be dictating the specifics of it. But what I would say is you, you at least have to tell me why, one way or the other, and it has to make sense. And then it has to work. And that's the high – that <laughs> hey, but, hey, that's the way it goes. That's the high-stakes game of the NFL. High risk, high reward. That's, that's the nature of the game. So, so what if he does it and it doesn't work? Then you, you know, fire people and you move on. That's just the way it goes. That is literally, but 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 they they've avoided that in Pittsburgh because they've had this model, Chad, that has just worked. They've known who they are for the existence of their entire organization. And even in a lousy year like this year for them, they made the playoffs. The Steelers making the playoffs is kind of ridiculous this year. It's absurd with all seven. the issues they have. I, they, yeah. they did it, though. How the fuck did they do it? I mean, of all the NFL stories, and they're probably going to get shellacked by the Bills, but still, how did they do it? How did they do it? They did it because you what you just talked about. I think everybody in the building knows who they are. So it's not they're constantly trying on new coats and trying to figure out which one fits. They know what that coat feels like. They know exactly how it's supposed to fit. When the scouting department is looking – for an outside linebacker, they're looking for Joey Porter, Clark Hagans, Chad Brown, TJ Watt, Greg Lloyd, Kevin Green. They know exactly what they're looking for. So while every year is not a 100% smashing success, 
to never have a losing record in 16 seasons as Mike Tomlin has had. That's crazy. It's, it's an incredible run of success. And, and the ownership is certainly a part of that and the very steady nature within that that allows the football people to go out there and do what football people do. And wait a second. They have never had a losing season in 16 years with Tomlin? Tomlin. No, no, he's is never had a right? losing season. That yeah. is correct. Holy he's been eight shit. and eight, but he has not had a losing season. And the yeah. Broncos have had seven straight losing seasons. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, and, and, and also the Steelers have had three coaches since 1969. The Broncos have had three coaches since 2021. <laughs> 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 so that's something. But the, but the, these organizations wow. are also very, very different. I mean, spiritually always have been. And so I don't think that you can, like, you know, try to be the Steelers. It, it, I, don't, I don't think that's Bronco football to be the Steelers. You know, mm. Mike Tomlin took over for Bill Cowher. Bill Cowher took over for Chuck Knoll, and it was the same thing throughout. And the Broncos have gone through a lot of changes, you know, based on the quarterback they had, based on the coaches they had, and the style of play they tried to do. They didn't kind of keep it the same the entire time based on the personnel. Um, and so and so I think that we got to keep that in mind and try to find our thing. What's our new thing? What's Sean Payton's mm. new thing? We talked a little bit about it yesterday. Sean Payton tried to be a running team this year. That didn't work. It didn't. No. didn't. I mean, he said you were going to do it, but he did, you didn't really do it. You didn't run the ball very well. So what are the Bron what's the Broncos thing? What's their identity going to be? We did discover one thing. We now know why the Broncos had an onside kick as the opening uh, play of the year. Uh, Sean Payton said he needs to get his eyes fixed, and he called the wrong play one time, and it was embarrassing. I want to get my eyes what? fixed. <laughs> so I call the right play, and I don't mess up and call a wrong play on a play that happened one time this year. That was embarrassing. Now we know. I love now, that. that. Now I'm, we know. Now that wasn't the onside kick. That oh, was a, I got it. That's, play a, call. that's a Johnny Love joke. All credit to our guy, Johnny yeah. Love, who uh, made that joke, but. But that was a moment of Sean Payton saying, I thought Sean Payton had a good presser. Frankly. I think we did too. I think he came off as human, uh, a little self deprecating. <laughs> oh, you're laughing. All right, Nate. No, no, I'm laughing that you called him human. It was oh, just funny. Okay. <laughs> well, he, he wasn't a jerk. He press conference time length Penner, 13 minutes, Payton, 16 minutes, um, Sean Payton, 26 minutes. And uh, I just think, I think dealing with Russ is is tricky beyond tricky, and I think it's a huge weight off all their shoulders. I think George Payton, especially from Mark Kisla and Eric Goodman, had to take some shit, you know, about the whole threatened thing. And Sean Payton didn't have to take it, and neither did Greg Penner, but George Payton had to take it, rightfully so, rightfully so, because that's where things got discombobulated. But George Payton just stood up there. He just sort of took it. Um, and, you know, what are you going to do? Sean Payton doesn't have to take that. I mean, I think everybody's clear, Nate, how Sean Payton feels about Russell Wilson. And even though they try to poo-poo this and, oh, we're still thinking about it. I mean, give me a break. You're obviously trying to see if he's tradable for the next couple of weeks. And then you're just going to move on, right? Uh, I guess, yeah. Um I don't, I don't know the nuts and bolts of the money stuff. So the Broncos are going to have to eat all that money, right? No matter what. And if they trade him, then a team will take on some of that. I guess they'll negotiate that. Yeah, or what is it going to be? That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. But, but the, yeah. the, if he, if he's traded, the dead cap hit hits all this year. You can't spread it over two years versus him being released after a June 1st designation. So mm -hmm. that's the issue is, is you can trade him away and get some assets back, but then you have to suffer the massive $89 million cap hit. Uh, this year versus having it spread out over this year and next year. But they so, would take that because they value draft picks so much. They need them. And they've already said, George Payton said, we are not going to be in the first wave of free agency. Like they were like camped at Mike McGlinchey's door at the stroke of midnight last year. They're not doing that, Nate. Yeah, no, they're going to have to, uh, you know, play with the guys they got and um, yes. get some cheap dudes and, and draft and, you know, be smart with, um, you know, the, the young guys that they sign as free agents and try to build this thing. But that's fine. That's fine. You're, 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 we are trying to build for the future here. Finally, we can maybe address that and, and agree that, look, it's not about 2024. It's not even about 2025. I mean, Sean Payton is here, I think, for a decade. And it's really wow, about really? building. Yeah, he wants to win two or three Super Bowls, coach for a decade, and then leave. I, I would imagine. And so if that's the case, then look, man, build something that's a perennial Super Bowl contender every fucking year. How do you do that? 
You build it from the – you build it. You don't just put Band-Aids on it, and you don't just go get the guy like Russell Wilson who you think is going to fix it. You get a young guy who you can teach the system to, and you get a bunch of young guys who, who learn the system and learn to play together as one. See, I think Sean Payton's only going to be here for another two years. I think what? he's just going to – well, I think he's just going to burn himself out. And he's just gonna. He he will have made about sixty million. He'll be sixty two, and the 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 mansion in Malibu, and his wife Skyline will be calling him to return to TV and the the cush life of uh posh life of of TV. But is I don't know. Good, is he good enough on TV to just? I mean, like he can certainly get hired as, as a TV guy. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I don't think he's gonna be in the you know five six seven million dollar range a year like uh chris collinsworth or certainly no, not no. 30 plus million dollars a year like tom brady but i think he can make a, a decent enough living he'll make money here with the broncos where he can do whatever the heck he wants and live in manhattan beach again but the question i have for you guys is going back to this dead cap money do you take it all next year and just have your whole salary cap destroyed because you got 80 plus million dollars in dead cap it or do you try to spread it out over two years? And this kind of goes to your thing about Sean Payton only being here for the next two years. If you're Sean Payton, what would you rather? Just blow it up next year and literally field a team of free agents, value free agents and rookies? Or do you try to spread it out over the next two years and possibly field a decent team over the next two years? What's the best way to take your poison? One swallow, one massive swallow or two kind of big ones? I think it would be too spread it out over two. I think that would be better for the team, better for the continuity of the team. And, you know, football teams take a while to come together. So if all of a sudden, you know, next year you have no money to spend and then the, the next year after that you have a lot of money to spend and you sign some big name free agents like they did this offseason, it doesn't mean they're going to be good that year. It's gonna They're going to take a couple years to get good together. Football's a team sport. You have to work together and become familiar with one another on the field, familiar with the system, trusting in one another, trusting in the coaches. Like, like we heard from Sean Payton, they only put in basically the guardrails of this offensive system in year one. So, so this is going to take some time, and I think it would be smarter to spread that out over two years at, in regards to uh, relative to the health of the team. I think they'll spread it out too, and specifically because I think they're not going to trade Sertan. I think they should, but I don't think they will. I think George Payton is in love with Patrick Sertan because it's like a child to him. It's his first pick ever, and you know I heard it again about yeah we got that right in 2021, and I'm I'm like no you didn't, but okay whatever. You know they well, are. I they, mean, if they, he's one of the, it, come on, man. Like, like it's it's just because they didn't get a quarterback doesn't mean they got that one wrong. Because the quarterback you wanted them to take also sucks, and those oh. that guy's about to get dealt too. And all those guys are, would not have changed the fate of this team in the way that you're suggesting it would have. Justin Fields, who's the guy you were pounding the table for, is about to get shipped out, or at least has not had any success. And so, what well, has he? Uh, the, you're 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 going into assumed incompetence syndrome there, Nate. You're assuming yeah. the same thing would happen with Justin Fields here as happened in Chicago, and I just inherently okay. disagree with that because the okay. set of circumstances would be wildly different. You would be committed to that quarterback, and I just think the Broncos are inherently a better organization than the Bears, and it would have been much better from the get go. So well, Hackett and, and, and freaking Hackett wasn't hired then. Fangio, well, Fangio was, would have been real good for him. Well, maybe you would have moved on from Fangio too if you're committed to drafting Justin Fields, and you would have got a. I don't know. There's a lot of maybe you would have got O'Connell, who's doing a, a great job up there in Minnesota overall. He was he was being interviewed by the Broncos too. There's, Do you there's, realize that Justin Fields plays a brand of football that's not? It's very problematic for a quarterback. And, listen, and, man. We, we can get on the weeds on this if you want, but I just think it's silly to say things were going to go the exact same way one place as another place because the set of circuit, it's like a chess move, man, or like a pitch in an account of a baseball game. Uh, it's a lot different throwing a 2-0 pitch rather than a 0-2 pitch. You just don't know. The set of circumstances are just different. That, okay. that so So philosophically, do you need a quarterback or not? And you did need a quarterback in 2021. You did. And you got Sertan and you got a whole bag of shit that followed after it. So again, it's, no. it's nothing against Sertan. It's nothing against Sertan. It's about the philosophy of your organ, 
boy, really? Are we doing this again? Are we seriously doing this? Right. I, <laughs> I, want, love I, want... up, I love when you pick up the coffee cup. That's when I, you know. It's my transition curious. moments. You no, know. I just think it's a little bit silly to say that they totally missed. And Patrick Sertan is, it was just a, a, a mistake when he's literally, you know, everybody's top three, maybe, you know, one of the best corners in football. Um, and, and, I, and those other quarterbacks all suck. All right. Well, you're, you're making have had struggles developing quarterbacks and had shitty offenses and just, uh, you know, I think it's a little bit of a reach to say what you say. All right. Well, you're making a good argument about why they're going to spread that cap hit over two years, because certainly Sertan is means a lot to them. No doubt about it. And likely he's about to become the highest paid cornerback in the NFL. And by that logic, it'd have to be with the Broncos. And if you're doing that, you got to spread things out a little bit. So that's probably what they're going to do. They probably are going to extend him and make him the highest paid cornerback. And in order to do that, you're going to have to cut costs somewhere else. So Garrett Bowles, see you later. Justin Simmons, see you oh. later. Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, see you guys later. All four I mean, of them? Maybe. And you're going to have to, you're, you want to extend Patrick Sertan. You said it. And Cush is a, a free agent, as is Josie Jewell. See you, see you. I mean, these are some of the ramifications that are going to have to happen to do this. No, you won't have to necessarily lose all four of them, but and you're going to have to make now. some of – well, McGlinchey you're committed to. You can't get rid of McGlinchey. Okay. But Bowles, Simmons, uh, Judy Sutton, you got some decisions on those four guys if you're keeping Sertan. And I'm this is the largest dead cap hit in NFL history, just to give you some context there. Yep. Before this year – the largest dead cap, dead cap hit was Matt Ryan with Atlanta, $30 million bucks. If the Broncos spread this out over two years, it's $39 million this year, and then forty-six or $45 million next year. That's how big this is. So if you're going to re-up Pat Sertan and have that dead cap hit, you've got to release some veterans who have some non-guaranteed money. Jared Bowles no longer has any guaranteed yeah. money. Justin care. Simmons no longer has any guaranteed money. So this has kind of got to go this way. There's, there's, you, you, you can't have it all. You've okay. got to make some really, really tough choices here. Right. You're also, I mean, you're also making your, you're also contradicting your own point about different pitch counts and different pitches on pitch counts when you're talking about the subsequent sequence of events that has led us to this, and now you can't sign it because of this. What I'm saying is, 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 um, <laughs> Pat Sertan is one of the best players in football. It, it can't be a mistake. Second of all, um, the salary cap goes up $25 million every year. Well, not every year, but did last year. It's about to again this year. So that actually softens the blow a tiny bit, a little bit. True. Not a ton. But, um, but I'm okay with deal, uh, moving on from Bowles. Okay. I'm okay with moving on from Cortland Sutton and maybe even Justin Simmons. I mean, you know, Jerry Judy might have a role here. Um, Cush, you can sign. You could, but likely he'll just get a he'll he'll be like Matt Paradis. He'll just get an offer somewhere else. A four year starter at center. I mean, he'll he'll just get like nine million a year from somebody like Paradis did from Carolina, and he'll just be gone. I mean, that's just that's kind of how the way that goes too. All right, boy, our time runs so short. I'm happy to get into this if you guys got time, but Nate, I know you're on a schedule. We can do this tomorrow, but I want to get into Aaron Rodgers and Jimmy Ooh. Kimmel and all that stuff. Can't you want to wait. wait do you want to wait till tomorrow on that, or you want to do that now? I gotta fucking give my kid a daycare on time. I know yeah. tomorrow, tomorrow, yeah, let's do tomorrow, please, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because this story is bananas. Bananas. It's and, pretty and funny. The back and forth is great, and I did see Nate. You were getting into it a little bit. So tomorrow, hey, yeah. a little, a little, a little horizontal tease there, or Beep. vertical tease. Look at this. It's like a tease. It's like uh, you know, kill. I, I, I love you guys. I think you're the best. And, you know, when you're wrong every once in a while, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. See ya. See ya. <sighs>